Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. My name is Farah Kilidar, and I'm the CEO of the World Affairs Council of Houston. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all. It's actually wonderful to be at the Junior League. It's been a while since we've been able to get in here, so a great showing. Tonight's program, I would like to introduce our panelists. We have Philip Mudd, who is an expert regarding issues of counterterrorism, intelligence, and homeland security with Counterterrorism Strategy Initiative. He was the first deputy director of the National Security Branch and was also the former deputy director of the CIA's Counterterrorism Center. In those roles, he was briefed every day on the nation's threat matrix, that being every potential security or intelligence threat that is on the CIA or NSP radar. And I'm sure that got him uh, prepped for a great day. Great <laughs> Mudd is also the recipient of numerous CIA awards for excellent in counterterrorism. Sitting next to Philip Mudd is retired Lieutenant General Mark Hartling, who is a national security, intelligence, and terrorism analyst for CNN. Prior to this role, he served for 37 years in the US Army, retiring as the commanding general, US Army, Europe, and 7th Army. In that final posting, he commanded over 60,000 soldiers and cared for over 100,000 civilian workers and family members stationed throughout Europe. And he also engaged, trained with, and conducted exercises with 51 countries in Europe and the nation of Israel. Lieutenant uh, Hartling was also involved uh, early on in the Iraq war. Uh, so we're very honored to have both of our panelists here today. Uh, conducting the discussion and moderating is our own uh, Ronan O'Malley, who is Senior Program uh, Officer of the World Affairs Council and is in charge as well of our Young Professionals Program. Please join me in welcoming our speakers for the night. I just want to thank everyone so much for coming and uh, incredible crowd. I'm great to see it. Sorry that a few of you have to stand, but you know, hopefully we'll do our best to make it worthwhile. And uh, to both Philip and Mark, I would say I'm delighted to have you. I've watched you guys on television for a long time. Uh, they're on the news an awful lot. Uh, I think Philip told me yesterday he was on CNN 300 different segments last year, which is kind of crazy. Give or take. And, <laughs> and, and they've also appear a lot, you know, individually, but also when they're together, often they're, that's when they're at their best. So I don't want to spend too much time on the background, but just to kind of set the table for where we are and how we got here. Uh, Philip, maybe I just, if you could kind of explain basically what ISIS kind of emerged from out of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, why they developed, why they separated from Al-Qaeda, and you talk about that. If you look at the history of the organizations that I used to face, there's a couple of characteristics you have to focus on. One is what we call ungoverned space. Terror organizations, insurgencies move into areas where governments, central governments, lack the capability or will to project power. Yemen, Somalia, Libya. Ungoverned space, going back to about 2004 in Iraq, you see the, the uh, successors of Al-Qaeda, at that point Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and then ISIS saying, we're going to move into this Iraqi territory, partly because they had the second characteristic that defines a successful terror group, that is visionary leadership. In the case of 2004, a guy named Zarqawi who said, I want to establish a successor, if you will, to Al-Qaeda here, and I have a vision that competes with the vision of Osama bin Laden. So if you move forward, I think the American surge after that suppressed a lot of what we witnessed with Al-Qaeda in Iraq. But as the Americans moved out, as the Iraqis struggled not only to control territory but to, but to establish good governance in these areas, as the Civil War moved into Syria, the new morphing of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, ISIS moved in. Again, very simple model. Space where government can't or won't project power and visionary leadership. In the case of ISIS, a guy who's been around for years, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Uh, to close with your question on the differences between Iraq and ISIS, pretty straightforward difference. Al-Qaeda, uh, pardon me, Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Al-Qaeda looks at ISIS and says, you're moving too far too fast. If you put your head out that far, the Americans and everybody else are gonna whack you. 
you should be more cautious about trying to project power in declaring an Islamic State, which ISIS obviously has done, because when you do that, you're a magnet for Western forces coming up to take a shot at you. So that, to my mind, is the fundamental difference. Also, I think, believe it or not, ISIS is more brutal than Al-Qaeda is comfortable with. Al-Qaeda thinks that ISIS is alienating too many people by things, with things like beheading videos. And maybe just before we move on to the next, and both of you feel free to talk about this one. Uh, obviously, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, they're at each other's throats, not just in, in the Middle East, but also even in Afghanistan, surprisingly. Yeah. Um, do you see any scenario in which the two of them kind of come back together? Obviously, that would not be a good scenario. And if so, what can we, as the US, do to prevent that? You, know, you want to take that? Uh, to quick shot. I, I think there's a, there is a scenario. Um, Al Qaeda is on its heels. They do have remnants, obviously, in Pakistan, Afghanistan. I'm worried that that uh, over time, Afghanistan, especially uh, with the lack of capability of the government there to project power, I'm, I'm worried that Afghanistan will become a haven again. But they're on their heels. I think there is a prospect that if they continue to be decimated, if they lose their current leader, uh, that they will decide we don't have many options. The, the divide between the two is not just ideological. I think some of it's personal, and personal divides tend to force people not to make decisions they should otherwise make. If I were an Al-Qaeda, I'd say, uh, we're losing. We better join the winning team right now. But I, so small prospect, I, I wouldn't put it above 50%. Yeah, and I, I would agree with Phil on that. And, and I'll, I'll comment just a, a bit on uh, Iraq. Um, I, I did spend a significant amount of time in Baghdad during the invasion, uh, the early invasion in 2003 and 4. We were there for 15 months with the 1st Armored Division, and I went back, <coughs> excuse me, and commanded the division uh, in northern Iraq. Basically, that map you see up there, which goes from Baghdad up to the Syria-Turkish border, uh, with around about 450 kilometers of Iranian space on the side uh, boundary. And what we saw was various marriages of conveniences as, as different terrorist organizations, not just al-Qaeda in Iraq, but others, Ansar al-Sunna. Uh, you could name the, the bevy of terrorist organizations, would always eventually come together as they were being depleted uh, as part of a marriage of convenience. And I think we'll see that as we continue to deplete both ISIS and al-Qaeda, but it's going to take a long time. OK, and then Mark just kind of move on to ISIS's just incredibly explosive rate of growth uh, throughout uh, Syria and Iraq, yeah. um, taking so much land so quickly. Um, maybe first, could you address the uh, Iraq? Sorry, the, the ISIS kind of hierarchy. Where I mean, some of those those top level leaders are former Baathists, former uh, Saddam Hussein's kind of military. Is that where they got a lot of the training and the tactics and the strategy for it? Well, I think, it, yeah, it was a combination of a very extremist view of, of Islam, uh, an Islamist view of, of the Sunni religion. And uh, when al-Baghdadi was in a, uh, a U.S. military prison camp, I think he was able to generate some support from others that were part of the insurgency uh, and realized that in order to establish a caliphate on the very open boundaries be between Syria and Iraq, that he could certainly use some of the, the dis disenfranchised Iraqi military officers that were as a result of, of some of the, the, uh, the mandates that were put in place by the American government in the early stages of the war. And he used that much to his advantage. But he also used to his advantage uh, the Sunni support uh, for anything other than a central Iraqi government led by Shia, with, with a majority of Shia. And I think what you're seeing in northern Iraq, where mo northern and western Iraq, where most of these issues took place, is primarily Sunni land. And uh, they were tired of the Iraqi government. I saw that firsthand in 2007 and 8 when we were there. Uh, they wanted uh, support from the central government, which they were not getting. Uh, they were, there, were, there was infighting between the Arabs and the Kurds in northern Iraq. There are uh, 27 different tribal confederations in northern Iraq. And, and Western Iraq. And you're talking about a culture that believes in tribes first, then religion, and then the nation. Uh, so all of those things I think uh, al-Baghdadi and his team uh, used to their advantage in terms of conquering those cities. At the same time, uh, the, the Iraqi military that was not very happy and was not being supported by the Shia government in Baghdad. So then to go to the, the other side of the, the equation, obviously, with the fall of so much territory, the fall of a major city like, a uh, second largest city in Iraq like Mosul, uh, when it comes to the Iraqi military, was it an issue of not being capable or just having nothing to fight yeah, for? Yeah, no, absolutely not. What, I, what I've said repeatedly on CNN, much to the disagreement of Wolf Blitzer, they did not just throw down their weapons <laughs> and, and run away. 
what in fact happened that were the Iraqi government, they were a very capable force. In that area of Iraq, those uh, four provinces, there were five different Iraqi army divisions, uh, each with between eight and 12,000 people. Very good. I fought with them. I knew how good they were. They were ready to take the fight to the enemy when they were led well, when they were supported well by the central government. When the Americans left in 2011, that support from the central government in Baghdad faded away. The soldiers were not getting paid. They didn't feel they had anything to fight for. So when a contrary force came in, the ISIS army, they said, why should we fight to defend a central government that isn't supporting us? And they basically deserted in mass. You know, there's an interesting angle here that those of you who watched the rise of ISIS across <coughs> some of this geography in mid-2014 would have noted on the news, and that is the assumption that an insurgency taking territory is succeeding. Anytime right. an insurgency takes territory, two things happen. Think of the development of a terrorist group or an insurgency in step functions. It's not a solid line. It's a step function that is going from intimidation to government gov governance. That is a significant step forward. When they took that territory, I remember commenting on CNN, one, they exposed themselves geographically to a military that's eventually going to come back. Owning territory is a problem from an insurgency that can't fight conventionally. Number two, eventually they'll have to do what almost no terror group, maybe with the exception, for example, of Lebanese Hezbollah has done, and that is transition in those cities they now controlled from intimidation by beheading to offering services such as water, education, food. I don't think they've done it that well. They can't and, and do it that well. They yeah. can't. So if um, the way Americans framed that question in mid-2014 was ISIS is taking territory, therefore we're losing because Americans frame in terms of two weeks or a month. Counterinsurgencies typically are going to take 10, 20, 30 years. You had to look at that and say, if you frame this in terms of 10 years, ISIS just made a mistake. Yeah, okay. If I can comment, sure. too, in terms of that, in terms of running cities, uh, five of the six largest cities in Iraq are in the northern area where ISIS is. You know, the focus is primarily on Mosul when we turn in the nightly news, but you also have Tikrit, Hawija, Kirkuk, uh, uh, Tal Afar. Uh, Anbar in the western provinces. So you're talking about cities that range in, in population anywhere, Mosul, 1.5 million people, the same size as the city of Philadelphia, to, uh, to Crete, which has about 800,000 people. That's, that's pretty significant. And when you're talking about a group of people who are coming together that really don't know how to make the trains run and deliver the mail and have the sewers and the waters working the way the Iraqi people want, they will eventually lose the support of the Iraqi right. people in those cities as well. And there's not that many uh, ISIS fighters in those areas, but they are, as Phil just said, intimidating to the nth degree. Okay, and then maybe move on to another you know, major player in the area, uh, the Kurds. You both are familiar with them uh, militarily. Maybe uh, if you want to address, you know, Mark, kind of what your your impression of them militarily, and then I'll, I'll follow up, uh, Philip, with you or something else. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It's interesting to me to watch our politicians talking about we just need to arm the Kurds. They're great fighters. Let them go at it. Well, if you understand the culture of the Kurds, they are great fighters in the Kurdish regions. Period. They will not take the fight to the enemy in regions other than where that is that they consider Kurdistan. And by the way, that Kurdistan is not just in northern Iraq and northern Syria. It also evolves into southern Turkey and west, uh, eastern, excuse me, western Ara Iran. So you're talking about an amorphous blob of what is known as the Kurdish area or the Kurdish regional government, where the Kurds want a state. Period. And if we think they're, they're going to fight for all of Mosul, they will fight for what's known as the right bank or the right side of the Tigris River, but they will not go on the left bank. Uh, they will not go into Tikrit. They will not go into Hawija because that's Arab land. All they want is to establish their state. So the misguided notion that we can just arm the Kurds and allow them to take the fight to the enemy, if you've lived with the Kurds, you understand that that won't and, work. And you, you got to my next question. But Philip, would you concur with that, that impression that it'd be pretty risky to arm the Kurds with offensive weapons? Uh, I probably would be more aggressive in arming them, but that's because I assume that over time there might be a Kurdish state. Look, I have a lot of Kurdish friends, and behind closed doors, they'll say one thing. The longer that the central <laughs> government cannot project power into the Kurdish area, the better because they're sitting there saying, if the Syrian government can't control Kurdish territory across the border, if Iraq, the Iraqi government can't control Kurdish territory, that increases the prospect that not only do we control it, that, that we can begin to establish our own political state. 
It, my guess is over time that will happen. And uh, by the way, just personally in terms of dealing with them, I found them to be incredibly uh, ambitious, hardworking, thoughtful, smart people. So I say more power to you on that. Okay. What, what you may establish though in the establishment of a Kurdish state, I would only counter by saying it will be similar to the state of Israel because they will be surrounded on all sides by enemies. Iranians, Iraqis, Turks, and Syrians. That's true. Uh, and, and what you have, if you do establish that state right in the middle of that morass of enemies, it could be problematic. And truthfully, I, I agree with, uh, with Phil that I have many, many Kurdish friends. And what's interesting, in my old job of commanding in northern Iraq, I would go from my headquarters to, into Crete to my Kurdish counterparts headquarters in Erbil, and it was literally like driving, if anyone's been in California, from Barstow, California into Vegas. Because the Kurdish region, the Kurdish region is gorgeous. The best thing about it is you can get a beer there. Uh, I mean, it, it has high-rise hotels, beautiful conference centers. The Kurdish government is in existence because they have a lot of riches and they also have a 10-year start on the Iraqi uh, government. Did I just hear you say Vegas is beautiful? <laughs> I mean, some I mean, parts. <laughs> I, we're going to have Not to disagree you about that one. That whole city needs to be bulldozed, but all right, let's keep going. And may, maybe I, I don't want to get into the, the blame game, but obviously just to get to American foreign policy of the last you know, 15 or so years, um, you know, maybe both of you are involved at the highest levels. I know there's certain <laughs> things you can and cannot talk about. But maybe just to, uh, Mark, if you could start. Let with, him start. Okay. <laughs> well, with, I'm Let starting the with Intel you. guys start. Okay, Come well, on. I'll start with. Well, okay, I'll start with you then, Philip. <laughs> what is your impression of, with regards to the issue of WMDs? Was it that we didn't, that the right people weren't listened to within the intelligence no. community, or that Saddam had kind of was bluffing his way to convince, especially Iran, they'd actually still had these weapons? What, what, what happened there? Uh, Saddam told us what happened, and I talked to his interrogator, who's one of the smartest FBI officers I ever dealt with. Saddam was pretty straightforward. He said, look, you guys are thousands of miles away. I've fought a long, bloody war with my neighbors, the Iranians. The Iranians have a great conventional capability and a growing potential nuclear capability. There is no way that I could sit there, and this is Saddam speaking, and say that I don't have a special weapons capability, a WMD capability, when the Iranians are across the border. He would say, I never anticipated you guys would show up. So I would prefer to hold you off, even in the face of aggressive UN inspections, by saying, that I have WMD because I've got to intimidate the Iranians. He was pretty straightforward about it. Our mistake at the CIA, and I was there, was uh, the profound um, mistake of, of confusing what you think with what you know. Every analytic mistake I saw in 25 years was basic. Mirror imaging, they think like us. In that case, I don't think an intelligence officer could have said he does not have WMD. I think the intelligence community could have more aggressively said, we're not certain. Okay, but, but, but if I can okay, add sure. to that, uh, an interesting piece, again, having spent a lot of time with the Kurds, the Kurds just last week celebrated the anniversary of the, of the um, uh, chemical weapons uh, artillery rounds going into the city of Halabja. Mm. Uh, killed over 3,000 Kurdish citizens. Now, many of you are looking at me like a pig looking at a, pig looking at a wristwatch right now because you're saying, what the heck is Halabja? Google it sometimes, it was one of the biggest Kurdish catastrophes of, of people dying as a result of a chemical weapons attack by Saddam Hussein. The Kurds see that as a critically important date in their history, and it was an indicator, I think, to American intelligence that are monitoring this, this kind of situations, that Saddam had WAD, MD, he was prepared to use it, and there were a lot of visual signals uh, in terms of yeah. chemical weapon plants in Iraq uh, that people thought were still operational. I can understand how the mistake was made, but I agree with Phil that there was just... Some Within things. the intelligence community, Philip, do you think it was that the voices <laughs> of doubt weren't listened to, or they just weren't that strong and more no, people were not strong. of it? No, not strong. You, you had a history where people had gotten burned. During the first Gulf War, Saddam had more WMD in the war than, than people knew. He had lied in his declarations to UN inspectors about how much he had. Inspectors hadn't been there for years, and so there was a concern about what he was building secretly. There were false reports from informants about what was going on. So with the history of lies and the history of you, not only use of WMD against the Kurds, but of a more extensive stockpile during the first Gulf War, I can see how an analyst would say, we remain concerned. I think analysts 
there's a herd mentality saying we're, we're and therefore that therefore is critical we're highly confident he has this stuff okay. what they should have said is have we seen it have we had people on the ground what's the quality of our, our informant or source access to it what are the references to it in things like radio communications from mm -hmm. the Iraqis and the answer would have been boy pretty thin okay and now to move on to um, obviously the invasion you guys are both involved in, uh, in intelligence and military at the time. Uh, with regards to the policy decision of you know, the Bush administration and his uh, you know, foreign policy team to disband the military, the police, you know, high level government yeah. people, you know, any Bathis, everyone was thrown out. Um, I know we, we talked about it earlier, you had mentioned you were involved in some of those higher level meetings. Yeah. Thank you, maybe whatever you're allowed to talk about, discuss Yeah, that. well, I mean, it's interesting looking at this room. Uh, in, in early May of 2003, I was in a room just like, no, I'm sorry, it was later on in the summer. Uh, I was in a room just like this with about this same number of people uh, as a one-star general talking to about 600 retired Iraqi generals. And we were trying to recruit them. I was assistant division commander for the 1st Army Division. My boss was a guy named Marty Dempsey, who later became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And he said, go talk to the military guys and calm them down and tell them we want their help in getting jobs for soldiers. This was right after the invasion, but before the counterinsurgency started. So I was literally in the middle of presenting through an interpreter to a group about this size of Iraqi generals. When, I, when my aide came in the door, handed me a slip of paper and said, Ambassador Bremer has just disbanded the Iraqi army. Okay. Now, when you talk about disbanding the Iraqi army, that's one thing. But when you take away retirement benefits from general officers, that's quite another. So you had an entire room of old, very patriotic military sources who said, what is going on? You know, we, we did not always back Saddam Hussein. It was sort of, again, going to the theory that if you want a new idea, read an old book. Find out what happened to the Nazis in World War II where a military officer said, do not disband the, the Nazi party because you're gonna let the trains uh, go crazy and you're not gonna run the country because everybody's a Nazi, whether they wanna be or not. That was a form of government. The Baathists were the same way. So we not only had problems with the military, we had problems with those who ran the, the electric uh, companies, the water companies, the trash collection, uh, the teachers union, because everyone was a Baathist. You had to be a Baathist if you worked in the Saddam Hussein regime. So I think that contributed, I think, significantly to the insurgency in 2004, but it also contributed later on to the, uh, to the rise of ISIS. So I don't you know, want to put you on a tough spot, but Please where, do. Where, <laughs> where do you put most sure, why not? of Nobody's going to know where what you, we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. where, would you put, where do you think that decision or that policy choice came from? With, with, within state, you can talk about people or departments if that's easier. Was that from people within the State Department, intelligence community, defense? Uh, where did that come from? Ronan, you know, to be honest with you, I've read a lot of different um, papers on where it came from. Was it President Bush? Was it Secretary Rumsfeld, was it an independent decision by Ambassador Bremer? I can't figure it out. Okay. I, don't, I don't know who made the decision, but whoever it was um, took us back a few feet. And it should probably say something that we still don't, it's not public knowledge who made the decision. Right. Okay. And uh, maybe Philip, and both of you can chime in on this as well, but moving on to Obama, obviously has yeah. had his own difficulties in the Middle East as well. Um, what is both of your perspectives on basically uh, one thing I would say with regards to Syria and the issue of the red line for yeah. you know saying that there would be attacks on uh, Assad's uh, military if they've used chemical weapons which they did and we did nothing yeah. and then with regards to drastically basically pulling out of Iraq entirely and kind of leaving more ungoverned space. Well, I, I think many of my colleagues and we talk about this stuff a lot um, would say that the public debate about what's happening with the counter ISIS fight is not a debate that practitioners recognize. Most of us would say, look, the lifespan of insurgency, I said, as I said before, is 10, 20, 30 years. The local forces have to carry the weight in that counterinsurgency operation. The Americans can help them with things like military aid, intelligence support. The Americans have greater intelligence capability to take out point targets, not space, in other words, but a leader here, a leader there. And most of us, like it or not, would say, I'm comfortable with the pace of this counterinsurgency and counterterrorism campaign. Uh, taking into account the lack of risk to American men and women. So I think many, many, and I'm not, I've served in both administrations. I served in the Bush White House and I was nominated for a position by, by President Obama. I think many people in my position, not all, but many would say 
The pace of this, Americans want stuff in two weeks. That's not the way this game works. In terms of the red line, I think uh, I, I would take a differing view. Many colleagues, and I would be among them, would say, if the President of the United States says you can't cross a line, Republican, Democrat, Independent, Communist, Socialist, I don't care who he is, you got to do something. It doesn't mean you have to send American forces in. It doesn't mean you have to go to war. It means you have to bring some pain. And so I, I looked at that, and that's, I'm hesitant to critique anybody because I've been there, and these decisions are made simple by politicians. They are really tough. But that's one where I'd say it wasn't going to cost a tremendous amount to make it hurt a little for crossing that line. And I, I think we probably should have, I, I really, it's the only time I'll criticize anybody. I think we really should have made them hurt for that. Did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I agree completely. Okay. Uh, that, that, that was a critical mistake by the, the present administration, but there have been other mistakes by multiple administrations leading up to that. And, and, and truthfully, you know, uh, I'm like Phil, I'm, I'm trying to be as apolitical as possible. And you look at the decision-making criteria that, that leaders, presidents, commanders and chiefs make, it's tough. Uh, especially when you have those on the other side of the aisle that are attempting to pressure or not support. Uh, so, so there's, I think there's some fault yeah. all around uh, in a lot of these kind of decision-makings. I personally uh, am concerned whenever a president draws a red line. Yep. Uh, and like Phil says, when, when that does happen, you better be ready to back Don't up. box yourself. Yeah. Do not box yourself. Do not box yourself. yourself. And the leaders don't okay. do that. Uh, but just, just one quick example of this. You know, both of us, again, do a lot of CNN. People who say, we should be bombing more. And my answer as an intelligence professional is, A, do you think people in my old jobs don't want to whack these guys? And B, what do you want to hit, dude? <laughs> I mean, you've got to have a target, and the target has to be sufficiently secure so that you're not going to kill a bunch of women and children. Uh, that kind of commentary in the public domain frustrates people like me because we sit there and say it suggests that people like me are sitting back saying, wow, if we had a new president, shoot, maybe we'd bomb him. That is ridiculous. It is. Okay. All right. Am so, I clear enough so, on that? So would both, both, both of you agree that um, within our current capabilities and kind of, uh, you know, the region and basically we're bombing every target that is legitimate from, target? From a military perspective, yeah. I'll say this because I'm a military guy, we are doing exactly what we need to be doing right okay. now. And anyone that says hands are tied behind their back or we're not doing enough, like Phil said, they don't know what they're talking about because they haven't been there. Uh, they haven't commanded. They don't know what the targeting process is all about. Uh, you can't compare. Whoa. I didn't think it was that good, actually. <laughs> That's. I'm going to have to sing. I'm going to have to sing in a second. But, uh, but, but seriously, these decisions, when you put American lives at risk, uh, are hard decisions to make. And arbitrary bombing or, you know, whatever term you want to use, uh, it just, first of all, it doesn't work and it's not in line with the American way of war. And the American way of war should be the last resort. So what many people don't know, if I can, uh, that there has been a campaign plan in place for the last year and a half. Some of it has been better than others and we are beginning to see the results of a successful military operation. Uh, from an air campaign, a special operations support campaign, intelligence gathering, fighting for intelligence, and that's hard to do. That doesn't, you just don't flip a switch and know all the intelligence on where the bad guys are. That takes a very long time. Uh, and countering advances, taking out leadership and finding more intelligence so you can crush networks. Uh, that, we're, we're beginning to see the early stages of success. And those of us that predicted how long it would take said about a year. It's now about a year, and we're starting to see the shrinkage of, of uh, ISIS territory and what they're capable of doing. The problem is the campaign plan has several other areas that I don't think are going as well as they should be going, and it's primarily because there's not a belly button you can point to and say, you're in charge of doing this, make it happen. The funding for ISIS, the foreign fighter flow is extremely difficult because you're talking about many nations contributing to that and many nations trying to stop it. Uh, the building of the coalition, people don't want to join this fight. Uh, you know, it, you can say, well, we got to get other nations to join. Good luck with that. 
I mean, when you're engaging with other countries who all have their own national security uh, requirements, not everybody wants to do what we tell them to do. Uh, and, then, and then the other factors are uh, uh, the economic issues and the use of uh, recruiting on the internet. Those are two areas that okay. are not going as well. And I, I'm going to try and move along, but just a, another a reminder again, just because we have two such excellent panelists and also to allow time for you guys uh, to have some questions as well. We will go to about 8.15 or so, so a bit longer than normal. Uh, maybe quickly, we can just kind of run through the other kind of four major kind of national players uh, with regards to the issue. Um, uh, Mark, do you want to maybe address, you know, Turkey, obviously a long time NATO ally, but uh, for a long time at least, they seemed to have an open door policy with their border. They were not stopping or at least turning a blind eye to people, you know, crossing over uh, into Syria, into Iraq, uh, the, yeah. a lot of them who were going to join ISIS. And also, do you think they are kind of more concerned, their priority is with kind of holding back the Kurds or actually damaging ISIS? Yeah, again, it's the national requirements, the national objectives of a different country, in this case, Turkey. Uh, reminder that they are a Muslim nation, for the most part, in a very difficult regime that's, that's toppled. They have enemies on multiple sides. They have a large terrorist, Kurdish terrorist organization called the PKK that they've been trying to stop for at least 10 years. Uh, they have, I would say, not a stable government uh, in Mr. Erdogan. Uh, it, it's an okay government, not a great government. And like many nations of the world, ours included, they have border problems. But their border problems are exacerbated by the fact that there are tribal areas in those borders, and the tribal areas that have been there for millennial, uh, millennium have, have allowed people to transit back and forth, in some cases smuggling spices or cigarettes, now smuggling terrorists. Uh, so it's challenging to get a Muslim country with a poor leader to close their borders. We're having the same kind of problems on our borders today. What are we doing about it? I mean, so but before do you, we do you think that was stone, an issue of uh, lack of political will or just the lack of ability to close the border? A little bit of both. Okay. A little bit of both. Okay. Um, and what was the other question? <laughs> um, you, you addressed that. Okay, good. And maybe, uh, uh, Phil, I need to move on to, I believe you were posted in Saudi Arabia for a long time. Obviously, I don't want to put them all together, but the Saudis and some of the Gulf states, yeah. obviously, um, they're longtime strong allies, but the Saudis in particular, obviously the, <laughs> the proponents of Wahhabism, probably the most extreme form of Islam that is not uh, radicalized to the point of violence, um, you know, paying for madrasas and mosques to be built throughout the Islamic world, um, a less tolerant form of Islam. They are our allies, but they also in a lot of ways are feeding some of this ideology at a lower level. They're also, the money, they may have shut off the direct funding that might have come, say, in the 90s to go support people like, you know, others, Al-Qaeda in the past, but maybe they didn't shut down the private money. And so how do you address their, their alliance? I, I, I look at this in pretty simple terms, and that is there's a proxy war in Syria and elsewhere in the Middle East. That proxy war isn't just the Saudis who represent Sunni Islam and the Iranians who represent Shia Islam. It is two factions of a religion who hate each other. As you mentioned, I lived in Riyadh. These folks do not like the Shia. It's not just not about not liking Tehran or the Iranians. So as they see Iran project power into Iraq now, Saddam Hussein we think was a dictator. He was a Sunni. The current leadership is Shia. What do you think that looks like from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia? The Iranians have now taken over Iraq. When they see the Iranians projecting power into Syria, they're saying we've got to respond. And they're leading that co coalition of those Gulf monarchies to say, to prevent the continued incursion of the Shia into our territory, we have to have our own proxies in Syria. So I, I think we've been talking about the complexity of, of a lot of what we face. This one can be broken down into pretty simple terms. Major players in the fight of Sunni versus Shia picking proxies in Syria and saying we're going to fight through our proxies. Okay. And, uh, you know, Mark, maybe let's move on to Iran. Obviously, a long, since the revolution, a long time uh, mm -hmm. enemy of the U.S. Um, obviously, you know, other positions with regards to Hezbollah, what they're doing to Israel, um, uh, basically what's happening in Yemen, we're on different sides of, of that issue. But in Iraq, it's a lot of Shia-backed militias, the Iranian-backed militias that have been some of the best fighters and kind of take it on, ISIS, all that sort of stuff. How would you describe how we should approach Iran? Well, first of all, I'll comment on the Shia militias have been some of the best fighters. They have been some of the most willing fighters. They've actually been pretty terrible in the way okay. they fight. Uh, there's just a lot of them, and they're willing to die for their leaders. 
I, I don't understand it, truthfully. I've seen <laughs> them on the battlefield, and it's pickets charge most of the time, uh, just throw bodies at the enemy. Um, but they do have a willingness to do that, and it's, a, it's either a religious fervor or, or something I don't understand, to be okay. honest with you. Um, from the standpoint, uh, elaborating on what Phil said, uh, there is that pressure to, um, after several decades of a Sunni leader, Saddam Hussein, holding, as I once heard Nershavan Barzani, the head of the Kurdish government, say, he is in the chair, and when you have the power of the chair of the leading of the government, you can do anything you want in this society. Now, there is a Shia leader, or there was a Shia leader of the chair, uh, Mr. Maliki, who believed that he needed to control with the same iron fist uh, that Saddam did. Uh, that didn't go over well with the minority Sunni population in, in Iraq. We now have a new prime minister of, of uh, Iraq, uh, Mr. al-Abadi, who is more of a nationalist at, at, at heart, and he is not as beholden to some of the, uh, the organizations okay. that would push Shia. And uh, Philip, do, do we have any level of uh, cooperation with regards to intelligence with the Iranians? No, you're not going to. Okay. That, that would be seen in Washington as not only uh, um, a mistake in terms of intelligence service to intelligence service, but that's a political problem. Okay. The Congress would say, you got to be kidding me. And then, Mark, militarily speaking, though, with regards to, you know, drones and American planes mm -hmm. in common airspace, do we have coordination there? Do we now? With the Iranians, or is it through a third party? It is through, it's through a third party, but I will tell you, there are, there are similar, in, in, in truth, there are elements of each one of the parties in the same room, although the coordination between them is not uh, direct, it is more nuanced. Who, who is the third party? Well, Iraq. The Iraqi uh, military. The Iraqi okay. government, the U.S., the coalition, and the Iranian okay. uh, representative. And then just to move on to the kind of last big player, who obviously came in in a big way not too long ago and, and made a, a bad headache, an enormous headache. Um, Philip, and maybe you can get to it afterwards, Mark, can you address uh, your perspective on Russia? I'm not sure they made as much of a headache as we say, mm -hmm. because we don't like Putin, so anything we, he does, we say, uh, this is wrong, we oppose it. This is a pretty simple story. The Americans move out and create a power vacuum. I'm not saying whether that was right or wrong, I'm saying that's a fact. The Russians who want to reestablish themselves with a the traditional ally, that is Bashar al-Assad, say, I, let me get this straight. The Americans left the vacuum, and there's a risk in that vacuum that ISIS will take power. Why wouldn't we project power and support Assad so that he can prevent ISIS from taking power? Pretty straightforward. Uh, I think this is not only an effort to, to ensure that he maintains the alliance with Assad, it is a part of a broader scheme, which you've seen in Crimea, in Ukraine, where, uh, where Putin is saying, I'm going to reestablish the empire. It's not about the Soviet Union. I think it's a more czarist concept than that. The last thing I'd say is, to get back to my first point of, of, of not ostracizing the Russians too much, how much influence do we have on pressing Assad to accept some future, Zero. some peace process for Syria? I'd say our influence, zip. Now, once the Russians move in, we may not like it, but as soon as I saw that, my question was, why are we so quick, quick to criticize? We don't like what they did, but we may now have somebody out there, namely the Russians in Moscow, who can squeeze Assad. I don't think they particularly care about Assad. They care about influence in Syria. So I'm a realist. I'm not very idealistic in some ways. I would say there's a chance here we can bring peace to Syria, and now that chance goes through Moscow. Let's deal with it. Yeah. Maybe, did you want to touch yeah, on that? Yeah, I'd, I'd say a couple things from both an operational and a strategic perspective of what uh, Russia and particularly Mr. Putin is attempting to do. I, I put it in more of the nefarious realm, and it's, it, but you have to understand, this guy Sun Tzu once said, you got to know yourself, know the terrain, and know the enemy. And I'm not sure we have completely deciphered what the enemy is going to do, but my feeling on Mr. Putin is that he is trying to overthrow NATO writ large and cause major problems within Europe because we're connected to that. And when we said several years ago we were going to pivot, pivot to Asia, that was an opening. Now, when you're talking about how, you, how do you disrupt Europe, well, you take the 28 countries of NATO and the 20 other countries that are not members of NATO and you cause them a great deal of churn in Europe. And that's what he's done effectively by invading first Crimea and then uh, eastern Ukraine. The sec second thing you can certainly do is control the Mediterranean. 
Uh, and Mr. Putin thinks in this way. How do you control the Mediterranean? You have to have air bases and naval bases. And there is two, one of each, in Syria. That is the, in my view, that is the sole reason he is defending uh, Mr. Assad, because he wants to uh, ensure that the bases at Latakia and Tartuf are, are maintained to control the, the, the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, and then maybe just, I don't know if either of you wants to take it quickly, um, with regards to Syria and Assad's forces and ISIS, they do not go at each other in a large you know, volume of attacks and, and ground. Is that an issue of, of not wanting the same territory or kind of a gentleman's agreement that we each have other bigger battles to fight? What, why is that? There's, there's no gentleman's agreement between terrorists, but no. what, what okay. I'd say is mm -hmm. I, think, I think primarily Mr. Assad it wants to maintain his regime. He saw ISIS as contributing to that by killing the Syrian rebels because they are not true believers. They are also considered apostate. So he allowed ISIS to continue as the major threat while he focused on uh, the Free Syrian Army as they were trying to, to exude him from or uh, throw him out of power. Yep. Now that he has regained territory uh, from the Free Syrian Army and has bombed uh, most of those fighting to replace the government, he is shifting his attention along with the Russians uh, to, to rid themselves of ISIS. Okay. Yeah, I think it was a, to put it, to make it, and, and to use complex terms, a one at a, one at a time policy, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Philip, maybe just to move on to over the weekend, uh, you know, it was announced that basically the guy who's perhaps thought to be the number two guy in ISIS, yeah. the finance minister was killed uh, over the weekend. Uh, what does that mean in terms of the impact on ISIS? Either this is someone at an operation level has a huge impact, yeah. or, or how would you address that? Uh, it's not that easy. You can't replace people like that. The experience, the time, the respect they have within the organization. I remember when we were running CIA detention centers, one of the detainees referred to the takedown of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the architect of 9-11, and the detainee said that was like the melting of an iceberg. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in the Al-Qaeda organization wasn't just an operational commander. He was someone who had lived in the United States, someone who had been with the movement for years. You just can't. You can come up with another number three. You can't come up with the same number three. That said, think of this in two ways. When you're trying to destroy an organization like ISIS, in my view, the local guys have to own territory. That is, the Iraqi military has to retake that ungoverned space. That's not really for the Americans, nor is it for the Americans in Syria. For point targets, the leader, the second in charge, the operational commander, that's an intelligence mission. Intercepting their communications, running human sources in, running special forces in, as happened in this case, to, to capture or kill. So I think that operation was a success because it represented the fact that other people are controlling territory on the ground. The Americans are taking out leadership at the same time. I would just close by saying, when you see coverage of that, the framing of the news coverage is incorrect. Yeah. It will say, and we contribute to this mostly, Mark. <laughs> um, it, 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 I screw it, it up every time. <laughs> people like me will, will assess the significance of his takedown. You have to look at this in, in terms of pace of operations over years. So when we first took the first leader, the first major player we took off the battlefield from Al-Qaeda, I was there that night in, in Washington watching the intel come in from Pakistan was Abu Zubaydah. What I didn't quite realize was you got to take out one, two, three, five, six over the course of let's say five, seven, ten years. Look at the, don't frame it in terms of what that one player's significance is. Look at the pace of operation over the course of three to five to ten years and say if there's a pace of operations that takes out his successor, his successor, his successor, that is what you should measure. Yeah, and if I can say too, having been involved in many targeting sessions, uh, one a day for over 30 months, uh, when you're talking about uh, disrupting a network, which is the, what we're trying to do, is the news will come on and say, hey, we got the number two guy. And I once heard a reporter say, well, that's the, about the ninth time you've gotten the number two guy. What's going on? <laughs> and it's true, because if you take it as an individual, there is that replacement process that goes on. Oh. But when you're targeting a network, there are key elements of that network that you continue to go after until you just wear them out. And that's what caused, I think, the, the critical right. downfall of Al-Qaeda, because we kept targeting key members of the network. And the key members, number one, are the financiers. Number two are the operational leaders. Number three are the guys that pass on the Sharia law. Because every time a, an attack takes place, they have to get some kind of ruling in Sharia law. So if you can take out the imams who are saying, yeah, that's part of the jihad, go get them, 
then they don't have anybody to bless the attacks. And, and so at different levels, you're going after different targets. At, at the lower levels, you're just going after the pipe swingers. When you're at the, the, at the higher levels of the divisions, the corps, the so special operations command, you're going, there's a doctrinal term for it, it's called swacking the key players. What? <laughs> Schwack. I won't spell it for you. <laughs> <laughs> And, and maybe to move on to the ideology, which is perhaps the most difficult issue and the one that's obviously going to take a, an awful lot of time. Um, you know, maybe I'd like you both to address it. Uh, number one, is this something we're doing enough to counter? How do we counter it? Or, and or number two, in reality, is this something the ideological change has to come from within the region with itself? I think by and large, this is the, the, we can play in the margins in this game, but how do you go to a jihadi or to a villager in, in Iraq and say, you should think a different way? I'm not sure what credibility we have. I think Silicon Valley has a role, and I've, I've talked to them about this. I think they're doing a much better job over time about taking stuff off the Internet. That's Instagram, that's Twitter, that's Facebook. They spend a lot of money on that stuff. But I, I think over time it has to be people at home who are saying, we don't buy this. J just one quick point on this. These guys won't win. And the simple reason, it, it's, not, it's not an emotional judgment on my part. The simple reason is they are recruiting from a fringe, but they're not able to transition to say, we need to recruit the middle ground. It's like being an extremist Republican or Democrat going into a general election. It's very hard to win that way. Try to win when you're recruiting a 1% fringe. So they, you or can less than that, or less. less than one percent. You can intimidate over time, but my experience with terror groups, and this is one reason that uh, the predecessors of Al Qaeda struggled in, for example, Algeria and Egypt in the 1990s, is they tried to intimidate themselves and uh, into power. You just can't do that. For you got to govern at some point. Yeah, so I, I think they can't win. And I think there's got to be a better understanding on the part of all nations of the world, us included, in terms of what it's all about. Um, and I'll, I'll share, if I can, a, a quick anecdote. When I was in Iraq in 2007 and 2008, I had an Iraqi counterpart, a guy named Lieutenant General Riyadh, who was a good friend of mine. He was in charge of the Mosul Operation Command. As we were conducting operations, Ramadan came along. So I, I used to, when I, whenever I wore my uniform, I'd wore the American flag on my left sleeve with my patch, and I put the Iraq, because it's Velcro, put the Iraqi flag on my right sleeve, and they thought I was one of them, because I was trying to build that relationship with the Iraqi military. So when Ramadan came along, I, I said to General Riyadh, I want to participate in the Ramadan ceremonies with you. He surprised. So he took me in. We prayed a couple times during the day. I started doing the fasting in front of him. Not I ate when I left, but uh, <laughs> fasting in front of him just to get a feel and to say, hey, I was part of your organization. At the end of that, he gave me an English Arabic Koran. And there was a better relationship of trust of understanding what his soldiers were going through. We got to do the same thing uh, from a national perspective with our Muslim neighbors. That's what's causing the problems in Brussels right now. They are not doing that. They have forced the Muslim uh, uh, detainees into a ghetto. And I know we're going to get to Europe in a minute. Mm -hmm. But I was in uh, my old stomping grounds of Germany just the other uh, couple of weeks ago. Uh, the, the, the nation of Germany has taken in 1.3 million, 1.3 million refugees in the last year. That's a lot for a nation of 70 million people. But what they have done is a governmental perspective, they're, they're becoming overloaded right now. What they have done is they have not put them all in one place. Yeah. They've allowed them to, to integrate within the community. So you go to the city of Wiesbaden, a beautiful city in the spa region of Germany, and you will see those with abayas and burkas walking the streets and everything. But when they go home, what they've done is they've placed them in the community so there's not a centralized location where they can conduct the kind of attacks that they've planned and executed over decades in Malabik. Uh, this, this is not something that's just been recently. They've executed the attacks recently, but those Muslim citizens have been there for several years based on uh, the colonial wars in Africa and Belgium yeah. and the Belgium Congo. I don't, don't mean to give a history lesson, <laughs> but this is not something that just recently happened in Brussels and Paris. So maybe just to, to finish on that point, I realize, you know, obviously there's restrictions on what we can do with regards to challenging the ideology, but do you think we're also perhaps complicit in creating our own monster because we supported Mubarak, we supported, you know, dictators in Egypt or poor governments in, in Pakistan, the Saudis, uh, 
you know, people like Chalabi and Malaki, uh, Maliki in Iraq. Is, is, is that also part of the problem that, you know, created this frustration with people? Uh, boy, I, I would be cautious about taking that route. Look, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a believer in democracy, but when you take democracy away, or pardon me, when you take dictatorship away, take Iraq as an example, and you have societies that are divided by religion, by ethnicity, democracy exacerbates divide. Whether you like it or not as American, Americans don't like to hear that. So when the majority wins, the Shia in Iraq, the minority says, I don't have a place here. And their response is, therefore, I'm gonna to turn to violence. We want appropriately, and we heard this from Amer American political leaders after the Arab Spring accelerated in 2011, we want democracy for states. When you get that, it's going to lead those states to fracture in some cases. So the choice is very difficult, I think, for an American policymaker. Do you accept a dictator who provides security for people so that they can go down the street and shop, but who doesn't offer the chance for them to have a vote? Or do you support the American value of giving people a vote when you know that that leads to the prospect of violence when the ethnic and religious divides in the midst of elections separate? And if there hasn't been a cultural bias that has created as you, as you provide this potential for democracy, and yet there is no Thomas Jefferson or John yeah. Adams there to help it along. That, that's part of the issue too, where you're talking many times of nations who have been in trauma for decades, and when they suddenly find democracy, it becomes a very ugly process. You don't, if you don't have the leaders to, to lead it, it becomes even uglier. Yeah. Okay, and maybe you were, you know, touching on what you had mentioned, where, you know, to turn to, to Europe and the increased level and number of tax, I guess, uh, two things. Do you think this high number of, of big uh, sensational attacks happening with regards to ISIS in Europe, that perhaps that's a sign that they're losing territory and losing capabilities within Syria and Iraq, or it's something different? Uh, and then also, why in particular is, would you say Belgium is a relatively small country, an epicenter for so much of this? Uh, I think we're overthinking this. Okay. <laughs> uh, look, th th if you get this many people, in, numbering in the thousands, go to train to be indoctrinated in Syria, there's a certain number who are going to succeed in coming home and blowing stuff up over time. You, you know, there's a theoretical question that says, well, they're blowing stuff up because they're lashing out as a result of losses in Syria. I think they're blowing stuff up because they could establish networks and they got explosive yeah. material and blew stuff up. Okay. Um, if you look at the second half of the question in terms of why this is happening in Belgium, uh, one thing we do not have in this country, and, and uh, Mark mentioned this, is a concentration of second generation underemployed kids in ghetto communities. Uh, our, our immigrant communities typically are spread out across the country and, and with w maybe one or two exceptions not ghettoized. Um, in Europe, you see in the UK, in uh, Belgium, in Paris, immigrant communities typically Pakistani, Bangladeshi, uh, Moroccan, Algerian, who are ghettoized. Part of this is a cultural problem. That is, in, these, in America, nationality is, de is, de is decided by whether you took an oath or whether you were born here. Do you believe in values? In Europe, I think integration is harder for these folks because nationality might be blood. I am not German just because I was, yeah. I was swore to the Constitution. I'm German because I'm German. I, I think that really creates frustration among people who say, I don't, I don't have a place here. Right. Okay. And they're not welcoming. Okay. Um, and we were just going to, in one or two questions, move on to audience questions. So if any of you have questions, uh, we have question cards out there, and some of my, my colleagues will collect them. Um, what, what is each of your assessments of our current policy um, with regards to military and uh, intelligence policy with regards to ISIS? And also, what would you change? Easy question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Philip, you want to go first? I want you're the intel guy. Speak up, man. I'm the operator. I'll, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. We're talking about the application of military force, and you don't have a view. That's I have no view really. whatsoever. <laughs> it's part of our strategy problem. I, I, I think um, I look at the characteristics of success over the course of, let's say, 10 or 20 years. Enabling the local guys to own territory. People say, for example, put U.S. forces into Syria. Excuse me, when they take a city, who the hell are they going to give it to? ISIS? The Free Syrian Army, are you kidding me? Uh, you're going to give it to Bashar al-Assad. You've got to support the local guys to control territory. 
Afghan military, Iraqi military. Eventually, there will be some settlement in Syria, and we should be supporting the Syrian military. Hopefully, we learn not to disband them. Meanwhile, intelligence uh, maintains a capability to take out those point targets I mentioned. Leadership in the Pakistani tribal areas, leadership in Afghanistan, the second in command of ISIS who just went down. This is a grind. It's a piece of sand in the gears, another piece of sand next week. Slowly, over the course of years, the gears will be ground down. If the alternative is to let a few, a few more thousand men and women in the American military die to take territory that another military doesn't want to take, I'd say, no, I'm not up for that. Right. And I'm, I'm with them on that. And here's what I'll tell you, too. When I uh, was part of the surge in 2007, I'll never forget, my boss came in my office. I was a two-star general. Four-star came in, and he said, hey, look, Mark, Let's talk a little bit about what you're going to do down there. He said, first thing you've got to understand is we can't kill our way out of this. Now, I'm a soldier. And when you tell a soldier he can't kill his way out of it, it, it kind of drives your thought processes a little bit. And what Phil just said is critically important. If the government isn't there, it doesn't matter how many people you bomb, how many people you kill, how much carpet bombing you do, unless there's someone to turn it over to, you're just going to go right back to it. And look, I got a little box on my desk, um, and I hope I don't get emotional, but in that little box there are 253 cards with pictures on them from the soldiers I lost in combat. And every morning when I go in, and on the top of the box it says, make it matter. So every day when I go into my office, I open up that box and I take two or three cards out and just remember that there's a hole at a dinner table, that there's a son or daughter or a husband or a wife who's not there, and children are growing up because we offered up American sacrifices for someone else. And when that happens, if you want it more than they do, you're never going to seal the deal. They have to want it, they, Syria, Iraq, whoever, name that tune, they have to want it more than we do if we put American blood and toil on the ground. Okay. That's my second standing ovation. <laughs> nobody, I got, nobody I got, clapped I got for a applause. damn thing I said. I got I mean, two applause. Well, somebody, <laughs> I'm going to have to live with this guy now. Will somebody clap for him when he's through? <laughs> there you go. Um, just, just to move on to a, a topic that I know we'll probably get in our questions as well, but maybe just go ahead and it's, it's going to be out there. Uh, could each of you maybe give your impression upon the foreign policy and perhaps the approach to ISIS that the three kind of quote unquote front runners have right now between Clinton, Trump, and Cruz. Who uh, wants to start? You know, I, 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 this is going to sound like I'm dodging. I don't pay that much attention. First of all, I don't think they've said very much. Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, but I don't pay much attention because I know what's going to happen. I've been in this situation room probably 300 times in the White House. Uh, when they come into office, the, the military, intelligence, State Department, and others are going to say, homie, here's the deal. <laughs> the options aren't good. None of them is good. Mm -hmm. And we're not stupid. If the option were easy, we would have done it. So I, w I see this uh, as political campaigning. And this sounds like I'm being dismissive. It does not have much interaction with the reality that I lived and that they will face the day they come into office. It just doesn't. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll say sort of the same thing. Yeah, see that? <laughs> I'll say sort of the same thing, but to me it centers on, I hate to be so, so simple, but it centers on leadership. And part of leadership is not having hubris. It's understanding and empathy and realizing that you don't know everything, number one. Yeah. Number two, it's listening to the people who are your advisors who are knee deep in this stuff. I mean, there's a lot of people in the State Department, in the CIA, in the Pentagon who know this stuff pretty well. And for any of the candidates on either side to proclaim they have all the answers, it's, it's just ridiculous, to, to quote another one. I mean, it, I, I'm sorry, and I'm trying to be apolitical. Yeah. You don't know which side I lean on, and I, that's good. <laughs> but, but the third thing is, it's always tough. There are no, and I've been in the sit room a couple of times and in, in, the, in uh, some of the meetings with the president where they don't get the easy questions. They don't get the easy problems to solve. By the time it rises to the level of the president, these are some pretty tough things. And truthfully, they don't always get it right. 
They do the best they can. So that tells me from a leadership perspective, you got to have an extreme sense of character in your president. So it's not just you know, a sense of values and a sense of character and a sense of presence and an intellect. They got to put all those things together. And, and anyone that's shouting, proclaiming they have the answers, okay. just don't understand. And I don't want to let you, either of you off that easily. <laughs> but so. Uh, you think Philip, you're going to corner us? May, maybe I'll just stay. Hey, yeah. we, we deal with Anderson Cooper. You're <laughs> nothing compared to him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so Philip, with regards to obviously, you were there through all of it, um, you know, thick and thin, and, and good mostly or bad, thin. <laughs> mostly thin. Uh, with regards to, you know, I'll put him on the spot. At least Trump has said that he would consider bringing back some form of, of torture, quote unquote. What is your position for the intelligence community, and basically, how do you get people in the intelligence community and/or the military to follow something that's been declared illegal or unconstitutional? Well, he's never talked to an intelligence officer. Okay. Torture is a violation of federal statute. If, if he's ordering someone to commit what he refers to as torture, this is not me criticizing a candidate. That is illegal. And what, immoral. What we did at the CIA was determined, you can disagree or agree, by the Department of Justice to be not torture. People today look back and said that was a mistake in legal opinion. In, two, in August of 2002, they gave us a legal opinion that said you can do certain things confinement boxes, sleep deprivation, waterboarding. So if he's saying, I will return to those, I would have two questions for him. Number one, the Department of Justice will have to rule again. And I'm going to guess what a Department of Justice lawyer is going to say 14 years after that initial approval in August of 2002. They're going to say, no. <laughs> and number two, even if the Department of Justice were to say, we're going to go back to that time, CIA officers are going to say, no, <laughs> not because, I, you know, you hate this. I don't regret what we did. It was a different time in this country, but there ain't no learning in the second kick of the mule. <laughs> okay. <laughs> haven't heard that one before. And uh, Mark, maybe just uh, to follow up, you obviously, you know, uh, a candidate has you know, thrown out the issue of carpet bombing and making the sand glow. You are, I think, addressed that already. But obviously, that's not possible to do. Um, but maybe both of you can address the idea. I know not to pick on Trump, but he's also he's come up with the idea of killing the family members of, of suspected terrorists or accused terrorists. I mean, that just seems obviously beyond the ethical issues of it, the impossibility of it. How do you think that's been hey, look, assessed in the military? Here's the other thing. And again, having spent a career dealing with young soldiers, uh, when you're talking about conflict and being involved in a war, you see the ugly side of human beings. And one of the things we tr train our soldiers and all of our military to do is to have a set of values. What is being stated here is to violate, th violate those values and just go kill people. That's, first of all, not who we are as a nation, and it's certainly not who your soldiers are when they have a sense of values. But the other thing is, you know, Phil mentioned the waterboarding, and I, and I recently talked to a CIA agent who conducted the waterboarding, and he basically exhibited the same things Phil just said. He dreams about it every night. <coughs> it sickens him. He can't believe he did it. He wouldn't want to go back to it. So there is a human dimension when you get an order from the commander in chief when you're asking soldiers or CIA agents to do something. And you better start considering that human dimension before you ask the nation to do something that is illegal and immoral. Let, let me see what you think, Mark. Let, let me be more direct about this. It seems to me, and, and this is going to be overstated, the farther you, you get away from the death of a human being, the more blasé you get. Yeah, really. So I go out and speak, and people just say, kill them all. I'm going to, let me be clear. A terrorist has a soul. That terrorist, and I'm not that spiritual, but is a child of God. If that terrorist is going to threaten to murder people, it's the responsibility of people like me to say, I can't let that happen. But if you lose the sense that every human being has value, you better get out of the fight. Yep. Okay. How are you going to applaud that? And uh, now just to move on to some audience questions, and I'll just apologize. We're kind of done. I mean, like, yeah. really? <laughs> you got, whew, just a little bit longer. Whew. We've got a, a great number of incredible questions. Some of them I have to kind of consolidate, and just for sake of time, I apologize, we won't be able to get to all of them. Um, but there's one here, it just says, uh, um, how do we learn from our past mistakes? 
and what have we learned, what should we learn, and then also with, it says with regards to a time, t is any timetable on regards to winning hearts and minds? You kind of each loosely address some of this, but maybe get to it a bit more. I'm going to address the hearts and minds thing, if okay. you don't mind, because I, I banned that phrase in, in the 1st Armored Division in 2007 and 8. We were not interested in winning hearts and minds. That's, that's the misuse of an expression. Because we were not trying to turn our Iraqi brothers into us. What we were trying to exhibit was winning their trust and confidence. That we were there for the same reasons they were. And we wanted them to be there for the same reasons we were. We didn't want to win their hearts and minds. We didn't want them to become our culture. It was just a trust and confidence issue that we were fighting shoulder to shoulder. Um, you can take the other part of that. On uh, learning it, I think um, <clears throat> we have this unfortunate, unfortunate um, aspect of our culture where we want to look in the mirror and say we're exceptional. <laughs> Let me tell you something. When you can't win the battle with OECD countries on child mortality, on childhood obesity, on educating a child in math and English, you better sit back and do what every leader should say, whether it's wartime or whether it's trying to think about how to improve American health care. How do we have the humility to do better? And walking into a room saying we're exceptional and we can't learn is not the way to do it, particularly when if you look at statistics, I'm an analyst. I pre pretend to do a motion on stage, but I do statistics. We are not the top of the universe in terms of the future of a child in, uh, in, with infant mortality, life expectancy, access to health care, and the way we educate a child. So uh, my, my point is, when you walk into the Oval Office and when you walk into the Situation Room, the first question should be, how do I do better? How do I have the humility to say we can always do better? Yeah, and that's, if I can add to that, there used to be a great show on TV called News Break or newsroom or something like that. And in the very first episode, uh, the panelist was asked, Will McAvoy was asked, uh, what makes America the best country in the world? And what he said was, we're not. And he just cited what Phil did. And he said, but we could be. Could be. And this whole concept of, as long as you mentioned Trump, making America great again, I don't know when we lost the, the striving for being exceptional. But that's, what, that's the real key. It's not being exceptional, it's exceptional, it's striving to be exceptional. Okay. Um, I have a few questions actually on uh, a column today from uh, Thomas Friedman. I don't know if I had you guys probably didn't have a chance to hear it, but basically no. talking about- I don't <laughs> talking, actually read anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, basically about the saying that uh, there won't be peace in the region until Iran and Saudi Arabia kind of come together. What's your position on that? <laughs> Sure, that's simple. <laughs> I'm not sure I agree with that. Okay. The, I mean, that, that piece, if that means no human being will die on a terror attack today, I'm like, okay, that's not going to happen because human nature isn't that way. I do think that there's a, there's a prospect for some settlement in Syria. I believe it will, like it or not, include Bashar al-Assad because people will say security is better than replacing him with a different alternative. People are going to say too many refugees, too much ISIS. Once that's resolved, you start to say, can we continue to stabilize the northern region of Iraq? As Mark had suggested, I think that the Iraqis are doing okay there. Uh, Yemen is an afterthought in my world. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, so I, I, I do think if my threshold for pain is pretty high, having done this stuff for 30 years, I think there is a prospect that we can move forward unless your definition of moving forward is if peace means real peace. Now there'd be a few, few car bombings here and there. <laughs> but uh, I, I think we can make progress, and I do expect that there'll be some resolution in Syria that will in include, as I say, an ugly future of Bashar al-Assad. Okay. There's, there's an Iraqi expression called shway shway, which means little by little. And I, I think Mr. Friedman saying that there won't be peace until the Iran and Iraq come together is, is an interesting commentary, but that'll take probably a few thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think better, just like having Iran and Iraq come together, it would be nice for us to get the Democrats and the Republicans together. <laughs> <laughs> 
But okay. I'm, what do I know? I'm just a soldier. Why don't we both run for office? That would be like... <laughs> oh, seriously. That would be a horror yeah. show. <laughs> that would be a horror show. Um, Look, I have, Wolf. I, I have multiple... <laughs> <laughs> Multiple questions here on Russia, and maybe uh, Mark, if you want to uh, take it at first. Uh, number one, how effective was Russia with regards to helping Assad? And number two, if either of you want to take it, um, I know Russia, quote unquote, was withdrawing for forces. Were they really, and what was really yeah. happening? You want to take the effective? Yeah, Russia first? they were extremely effective. Okay. Um, I mean, they provided air support, and anybody that knows anything about desert warfare, if you have air support in the desert, you win, period. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing. You can have a terrible fighting force, and as long as you have an air force over your head or attack helicopters, you're in good shape. So he has, in effect, turned around and given a new momentum to Assad's security forces in order to uh, counter the rebels, the free Syrian rebels. Uh, it's been significant. Um, so yeah, I'd say he's been extremely successful. Did he pull out? No, I mean, I, it's, it's fascinating to say that two weeks ago he said, I'm leaving. Uh, Syria, the mission is done. And the following two weeks, he put over 80 in two weeks uh, close air support missions over Palmyra and Holmes. And all indicators are he didn't pull a single jet out. It's part of the misdirection of, of Russia and Mr. Putin in terms of trying to do the things and get a seat at the diplomatic yeah. table. It's like he, he's a classic in saying, if I just say it, it's true. It's like me saying, you know, I'm George Clooney. I mean, <laughs> the hell you know why not I'll just insist I'm actually George Clooney uh, but I think the, the, the game he's playing is fascinating because I, I think the game is I want to sit at the table at the diplomatic table because there will be a settlement if I maintain an extensive force presence there or at least don't pretend to withdraw it's harder to go to the diplomatic table people are gonna say all you're doing is propping up Assad you're not a force for change what he's done is a mirror game to say, yeah, I'm pulling out. He's not. And then he's going to say, since I pulled out, I can help to be a force for change at the diplomatic table. The dude is really smart. Okay. And by the way, uh, if anyone's interested, there's a great book that just recently came out on Mr. Putin called Putin Country by Ann Giral, who's a um, uh, uh, reporter for NPR. And it talks about what's going on in Russia and why they support this guy. Uh, and again, it's, it's a cultural uh, aspect of why the Russians think this Looney Tune is good for the world okay. and good for them. Maybe it's the, a last question. Uh, I think the, whoever wrote it was addressing it to you, Mark, but basically both of you can touch upon it. Um, it says, no. um, you mentioned the uh, American way of war. What is that today? And compare it to what you think it should be. <laughs> Another easy one. Yeah. Well, first of all, the American way of war depends on, and I've said it already, the, the extreme values that are inculcated in our military personnel. These are not mercenary soldiers, and anyone suggests that they, who suggests that they should be or who we should uh, garner wages for putting people in different countries to protect our national interests just does not understand why soldiers fight. Uh, soldiers fight primarily not for their country, uh, not for the flag, they fight for one another. When you're on the battlefield, it's the person to your right and left that you fight for. And that's because you all believe in the same kind of things. Uh, so that's, that's how we train a professional force. I think we have it pretty good. I would not, uh, like many have said, say that we've got the best army ever in the history of mankind, because I don't think we do, but we've got a pretty good one. And we got to be very careful about asking it to do too much that is not in the, in the national interest. Okay. And Philip, would you like to address that? No, the only question I'd have, especially having witnessed the, the, the rise of drone warfare, is hmm. uh, the capability that you give a president to intervene in places with lethal force without having to put a man or a woman on the ground. I think this is an interesting question for the future. We are focused on terrorism. I view a far bigger threat to America as drug cartels, and my metric is uh, the effect on an American child. Terrorism doesn't affect American children by and large. I have 10 nieces, I don't have children, I have 10 nieces and nephews. Drugs do, especially uh, synthetic opioids. Why wouldn't we say if the metric for use of force is the effect on an American family and American child, why wouldn't we say a cartel leader is a higher value target than the leader of ISIS. That's what I would say. And if that's your judgment, why don't you put some lead on his head? I'm not saying we should do that. 
What I'm saying is the question over time, it's an interesting question, whereas in the past, the American president had to say, do we move in with people? Do we enable the local guys? We now have the capability to intervene against non-state actors like human traffickers, uh, people trafficking in women, in particular drug traffickers, with a capability we didn't have 15 years ago. I'm really curious about whether people are going to start to say, are the lessons of taking out leadership in terrorist organizations applicable elsewhere? And I don't know what the answer is. Can, can I add one more sure. thing? Because yeah. Phil brought up drone warfare, and I think that it is something that's causing a great deal of, of discern in, in the American military. Because it gets to the issue of why we fight and what we fight for. And if you can put a machine to do it, uh, is, does that give us permission to do things we might not otherwise do with real live human beings? And there was an interesting um, uh, survey conducted at, one, at, at a major university that I won't name, but I will say they are one of the four that are in the final four here in Houston <laughs> this week. <laughs> Where when, when over 100 students were asked the questions, should we put more boots on the ground in Iraq to fight ISIS, 63% of the student body said yes. Wait, there's more. <laughs> The follow-on question is, would you be willing to do it? <laughs> and it was less than one-tenth of one percent. Wow. So it's real good sending other people's sons and daughters off to fight for uh, amorphous thing that we forget about. And by the way, just for your interest in national security, uh, in 1994, President, uh, 1996, excuse me, President Clinton put uh, troops in Kosovo and Bosnia on a one-year mission. There are still 780 U.S. soldiers continually flowing inside of Kosovo. So it's now several years later, <laughs> and we still have soldiers there. So when you put people someplace, I would suggest from a military perspective, don't forget you put them there. <laughs> and uh, maybe just a last follow-up then, then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, you obviously, you touched on it, you mentioned it. Do you think because since Vietnam we've gone to an all-volunteer military force, uh, so you know, relatively small number of Americans actually are in the military and maybe a small number have family members or close friends who are in it. When it comes to the intelligence community, probably even a much, much smaller number of people or would have a connection to it. Do you think the fact that we are kind of socially disconnected from it is, is a major issue? And would either of you have a perspective yes. on, on a draft or some form of social service? Yes, it is a major issue. Less than one-tenth uh, of, of our population serves wearing the cloth of the, the country right now. Uh, I, I told Ronan as we were driving over here, we were just having a conversation about getting to know each other. And I told him, we have two sons and a daughter-in-law who were in the military and during the period of 2003, to 2012, the four of us uh, were continuously in combat at one time or another with the exception of five months of that time. Now my wife is a real hero because she was watching all that crap on the news while we were fighting. Now the other thing that I would say is yes, it's a very small percentage that is fighting our nation's war. In regard to your other question, should we have a return to the draft? Absolutely not. Should, however, we have some, for to, some form of national service, I believe absolutely we should. We should have a generation of people who realize that to live in a country that's striving toward exceptionalism, you should have to serve in one way or another, whether that's teaching, building roads, whatever, I don't care, but some type of service. I, complete, I completely agree. I completely agree. I would say, look, there's a cost to living here. Uh, whether it's cleaning up inner cities or educating kids, um, people should pay for a couple years to say, if you want to live in a country this great, it's not free. So make them serve. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I just want to thank the audience, especially those of you who are standing, and thank you for your patience and all the great questions. And especially thank you to, to Mark Hurtley thank and you. Philip Mudd. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank that was you. excellent. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good job, man. Thank you. Thank you.